Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. After the longest, craziest, most contentious and uncivil campaign in memory, Donald Trump has been elected president of the United States. It has caused great jubilation in some parts of the country and dismay and even despondency in others. For those who haven't noticed, our country is badly polarized and it faces enormous challenges. The economy works primarily for the favorite few. Voting rights remain under serious assault. Our system of financing campaigns, dominated by big money and often dark money, is a scandal. And issues related to racial justice, immigrant rights, and the way we treat women in this society were front and center during the presidential campaign and should remain so now. We'll talk about all of this with my guest, Miles Rappaport, a longtime democracy advocate who has served as Secretary of State in Connecticut, as the president of Demos here in New York, and as the president of Common Cause. Miles, welcome. Morning, Bob. Good to be here. Um, I thought when we scheduled you, uh, frankly, that I thought we'd be talking about um, what we should be doing in the early days of a Hillary Clinton presidency. And of course, that is not the case. So I guess my first question is, what was your personal reaction when it became clear on election night that Donald Trump was going to win the presidency? Uh, I was surprised. I really didn't, like many people, didn't see it coming, although in hindsight it was hiding in plain sight, it was. really. Um, and my first uh, con uh, was a, uh, feeling was a sense of real concern for the people who were most vulnerable, right. in, at least in terms of the, the, the conversation during the campaign i.e. people who are uh, uh, affected by immigration policies, uh, people who are in need of health care. So all of, those, uh, all of those things. But I also think that there's a lot to chew on, a lot to learn, and a lot to go forward with. Since so many people in, in the waning days of the campaign, even Republicans thought that Trump was going to lose. Um, so, so many people were incorrect. Why did he win? What were the, the primary factors that put him over the top in this election? I think there were really three things, and it's what I mean when I say it was hiding in plain sight. Uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, people were clearly, clearly dissatisfied. So this was a change election. They were seeking a change. Uh, you saw it in Bernie Sanders' is unexpectedly very strong uh, challenge to Hillary Clinton during the primaries. You saw it in, in Trump. Uh, you know, dispatching all of those people in the uh, um, in the primary in the Republican primaries, and you saw it in the kind of wrong track, right track kind of uh, polling information. So that's number one. Uh, number two, I do think that this uh, was a, was a, uh, an election that was about race. Uh, yeah. There's no question that Trump appealed to the kind of sense of uh, s uh, status anxiety loss among white uh, voters, particularly white right. men. Um, and that uh, the fear of the kind of new American electorate was, uh, was a real motivating factor. But the third thing was 40 years of an economy that has disregarded the needs of the working people in the middle right. class as well as poor people. We've said it um, all along. I yep. mean, you wrote it in the, in the, in the New York Times, um, you know, more times than you can count on, uh, on, uh, on 20 hands. <laughs> um, and so did I. In, right, in many absolutely. situations, the, the, all of the income gains in the, since the recession of 2008 went to the 1%. All of them. You know, go back 40 years, the 90% the of people in America have either seen their wages be stagnant or declining. You can't do that for 40 years and expect that at some point it's not going to bite you. So I think that this was a long time in the making fundamentally, and also that points the direction to the future for those people who want to see a change going forward. Now, one of the ironies, of course, is that so many of the problems that you've talked about, I mean, the Democrats were complicit in, in, the, in the situation, but so many of the problems you talked about for working people and the poor were driven by Republican administrations and Republican policies, and yet we have much of the elector returning to the Republicans uh, to correct those um, ills now. Why do you think the GOP has not taken more blame for this, the the situation facing working Americans and poor people? You know, the Republican Party has always had a very interesting uh, catch-22 kind of situation where they have uh, obstructed the ability of government to really do something for people. You know, we have had a much stronger health care plan. We've had a much stronger uh, level of investment in education, um, you know, and in infrastructure 
if it had not been for resistance from the Republican Party. And then when government doesn't do anything to solve <laughs> ordinary people's problems, they say, see, right. government doesn't do anything to solve your problems. And they having, blame the Democrats having, who have created Democrats So they've benefited from that in, a, in an ironic yeah. way. Um, you know, but I think that they have some real challenges going forward as to what is the identity of that party, as do the Democrats. Right. So we're in a situation now where, so the GOP controls not just the White House, but both houses of Congress. What do progressives, liberals, do now? I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty dire um, situation. The Supreme Court is, is lost for, uh, is going to be lost for uh, de generations, presumably, de uh, decades, presumably. Um, so what's the strategy going forward for, um, for progressives? What do progressives have to do right now? You know, it's I'm still processing, of course, but, the, but for me it comes down to three things that I think the progressives really need to do. One is, I think, to defend and uh, strengthen the institutions of democracy in the country. Um, actually, one positive point during the election is uh, lots and lots of people voted. There were very few reports of problems at the polls overall, right. you know, the kind of the sense of uh, intimidation that the polls uh, uh, didn't happen. Um, most of the voter suppression laws that were passed in legislature, state legislatures around the country were pushed back right. uh, in the courts. So I think one thing is to make sure, and especially in some of Trump's conversation, threats to basic norms of democracy have been present. So I think the Democrats and progressives have to, one, make sure that we push back against attempts to weaken our democracy and continue to expand it. Number two, there is, the, is to continue the conversation on race in this country. There can be no going backward in the progress that has been made uh, in opening up uh, opportunity for communities of color, uh, you know, for women in the, in the country. So the fact that there was a white lash, as Van Jones called it, right. uh, in response, can't mean that the Democratic Party or progressives uh, go backwards on it. That conversation has to continue. And thirdly, uh, progressives have to continue to put the issue of economic inequality, economic security, economic opportunity on the country's agenda. If the Democrats don't do that, if progressives don't do it, then there's no reason for people to uh, uh, change back in a different direction. So let's look at some of these issues. You mentioned economic inequality, but some of these issues that are, have always been so important to um, progressives or liberals, depending on your choice of um, labels. Um, you've got the economic inequality, um, you've got uh, voting rights, um, you've got campaign finance reform, uh, you've, you've got climate change, um, which uh, Trump is on record as saying that it's a right. hoax. Um, so uh, is there a way to prioritize any of those things? Or is there something that needs to be focused on initially and, and the strategy developed? So for example, is it economic inequality? Is it to continue the fight for um, 15? Or is it campaign finance reform? How do you make that, that kind of determination? You know, I think there are some key economic issues that, ha that were raised, were popular in a bipartisan way that need to be continued. So the raising of the minimum wage, there were four referenda around the country about raising the minimum wage. They all passed. Um, you know, the issue of debt-free college, right. an issue that Demos uh, and first uh, Important pioneered, issue, right, exactly. That would really make a huge difference to working families in this country if uh, you actually had the ability to send your kids to college and not go into debt or have the kids go into debt as a result of doing it. So infrastructure to create jobs, um, you know, things to support the ability of middle class families to get, to, to get by, retirement security, those, are, those economic issues are core. And then I think on the democracy issues, I think uh, restoring the Voting Rights Act, uh, pushing back against right. all kinds of voter suppression. And I do think there's an opportunity to change the campaign finance uh, uh, laws. I think Bernie had it right in the campaign about the rigged uh, campaign finance system. Trump joined in some of that critique. Uh, so maybe there's an opportunity to make some headway there. It seems to me on campaign finance that the, uh, the easiest way, maybe the only way to get ahead on that would be changes on the Supreme Court. I, I just don't believe there's going to be a, a, a constitutional amendment, for, for example. Um, do you feel um, that that's a, a lost cause now? The vacancy caused by Scalia's death is going to be filled by Donald Trump, and they're going to presumably put a conservative, if not a right-winger, in that spot. 
clearly in the in the litany of things that could be completely awful in a Trump presidency, the uh, Supreme Court appointments loom very large, uh, and you really do need a Supreme Court change or uh, reversal of some of those decisions. But there are things, whether it's public financing of campaigns the way we have in New York City, um, or stronger disclosure, or putting limits on what the kind of um, secret money uh, can do uh, and levels of coordination. There are things you can do even within the current Supreme Court rules that would make a difference. So I think fighting on that, um, but I really think fighting on voting rights uh, is a critical uh, need for progressives to move forward. And that's a winnable, that's a winnable fight, I, I, I think. I think it is still yeah. a winnable fight. Uh, you know, obviously it's uh, harder uh, now. It would have right. been very winnable uh, with the Clinton presidency. But we'll see. I think it's also something that can unify the Democratic Party in important ways. The uh, Republicans, after Barack Obama was first elected president, um, they adopted a very uh, deliberate strategy of uh, obstructionism. You know, they were going to do everything they could to undermine his agenda his, and, and to defeat his policies. Um, what do the Democrats do now with the, with the, the strong feelings evoked by a Trump presidency? Do they go down a similar path? Do they try to undermine um, uh, everything that they disagree with about Trump? Or do they try to f see if there's any kind of common ground? It's, it's another one of those catch-22 yep. advantages that the Republicans have had, which is that since they didn't really want to govern and use government as an instrument of problem solving, obstructionism was a more natural uh, uh, path, I think. Uh, Democrats are probably constitutionally incapable of doing that. <laughs> but I do think there are two things that, that, uh, that Democrats uh, can do. One is to find places where there is the opportunity for consensus uh, and try to make some decent legislation. The first thing that comes to mind is the, in the whole infrastructure issue. Yep. One thing that, uh, that Trump talked about, that Democrats talked about, is a major investment in infrastructure. Now that runs up against the small government, low taxes, uh, ideology of the kind of the free market uh, conservatives. We'll see what happens. Right, that's infrastructure a, that's is important, and it's pretty clear they're going to do big tax cuts right away because they can get that. Uh, Trump wants them, and the Congress will pass them. So you have big tax cuts on the one hand. Where's the money for the big investment in infrastructure? A very interesting question. So, yeah. but I think going back to the question of so, so infrastructure is a possible place where there can be some. Uh, some progress in, in a bipartisan way. But the other thing I think that, that the Democrats have to do is continue to put forward things that really address the issue of income inequality. Yep. You know, whether it's reigning in Wall Street and, uh, uh, you know, whether it's debt-free college, whether it's retirement security and expanding Social Security. Things, those are things that will not pass. And they're popular with the public. But they're so popular with the public. difficult for the Republicans to fight them. Right, yeah. right. I mean, the hope for, I think, you know, Democrats to, to, to come back and, and, uh, and progressive comeback is to be clear that they are, in fact, the party of economic benefit to the vast majority of people uh, and that it, is the, that it is the other party who is, uh, who is resisting it. I think you can do that without being obstructionist, find places where you can govern, but also find places where you put forward bold proposals that are not going to pass but serve as markers for the future. I think it's fair to say that Hillary Clinton was not a great candidate. She's not a natural politician. That's not her inclination. It's not the primary work that she's done uh, throughout her career. Four years from now, there's going to be another presidential election, and the Democrats are going to be trying to defeat the, re the Republican candidate, you know, uh, presumably uh, Donald Trump trying to run for re-election. The Democrats don't have a great bench and a lot of the stars in the Democratic firmament are getting significantly older. Um, what do you see looking ahead in terms of leadership in the Democratic Party, especially progressive leadership? Well, I think what the, what the Democrats do have really going for them is the potential for a very powerful governing coalition. If you take what was described as the Obama coalition or, you know, in some ways the Hillary coalition and add to it those uh, working class and middle class white Americans who are not primarily driven by racial anxiety, but whose right. economic needs have not been met. You add that to the emerging and continuing demographic changes of the new coalition, you have something that is genuinely a majoritarian coalition for progressive change. And right. I think that's what we should shoot for. In terms of who are the leaders that emerge to, uh, to take advantage of that, 
that is something that's a that's I think is an open question. You know, I do think that uh, you know Senator Warren, you know, has been a really important uh, beacon for that. Um, I think there Sherrod Brown. I think there are other uh, candidates who have been clear on an, an, an economic agenda that appeals to the 99 percent and really pushing that. We'll find people who will do that. Part of this um, uh, progressive coalition going forward would be. Um people concerned about the environment and especially um, climate change, which already has quite a movement um, going. How do you bring them more into the fold um, politically and sort of um, show the community of interest between, for example, um, climate change activists and people working on Fight for 15 and, and maybe the labor movement and, and people who care about campaign finance, is it a way to begin to pull those strands together? You know, I think there is. And I think there has been an emerging uh, sense on the part of the environmental community, A, that you've got to be concerned with democracy issues. So I think there's a way to pull the environmental coalition and the kind of pro-democracy forces together. You know, but clearly a any part of, an, uh, of a real infrastructure program will be the, the development of clean energy sources and in real investment in alternative energy, uh, investment in, uh, um, the, uh, you know, the dislocation that uh, uh, a diminution of fossil fu fuel use will bring. So I think there's a way in which that can be done while advancing uh, a green energy agenda. That's what I think really needs to happen. And I think it can. I think it can. I think the, it's the, the, the beginnings of it are there. An issue that I thought was not creating, getting a great deal of attention before the campaign, but is now out there, is um, uh, women's rights, um, for example. And um, we saw in the campaign not just Donald Trump's behavior, but I, I think evidence of how pervasive misogyny is still right. um, in our society, and it wasn't talked about a great deal. Um, how does that begin to fit into the progressive strategy going forward? Is, is, there has to be a place for that among progressives, um, and I think high in terms of priorities. You know, in some ways, the rawest nerve that Trump hit during the campaign was the issue of uh, sexual harassment right. and uh, the ways in which women have been objectified uh, you know, by men. And that turned into a really pervasive conversation. On the good side, with women coming forward and you know, historic numbers to speak personally about their own experiences uh, and an understanding about uh, just how pervasive it is. I think as a, pol as a matter of policy, uh, you know, issues of, uh, of equal pay for equal work, issues of um, you know, strong laws against sexual harassment, and as a kind of civil society, uh, you know, whether it's on university campuses or in police forces or wherever it is, to try to, uh, to deal with that. But I don't think women are gonna be shy about raising that. I think the number of women in the U.S. Senate is right. higher now than ever. So uh, I think this will stay on the agenda. I mentioned Hillary Clinton as a candidate, but if you, if you look at both Clintons, Bill and Hillary, over um, the years, they have not been stalwarts um, as far as the progressive community is um, concerned. There was a lot of, um, when, when Bill Clinton was president, there were um, problems um, from the left when they were reviewing things like uh, so-called welfare uh, reform, uh, Democratic yeah. Leadership Council, uh, NAFTA, I mean, it, actually any number of issues. Tough on crime. Some of the tough on crime issues and stuff, you know. Um, Hillary, I think, is um, inclined to be what folks would call a moderate Democrat, even though she was pulled to the left, especially by uh, Bernie and his supporters during the campaign. How much blame can be um, apportioned to the Clintons for the defeat of the Democrats in, in, in this election? If, if, um, if, they had been, if they had had a more progressive record, or if Hillary had not been the candidate, uh, would we be in a different place now? You know, let me frame it in the positive. I do think that there was, through the debate, both the Sanders campaign and generally the, uh, the debate within the Democratic Party, I do think that the party has moved um, in a progressive direction on the economy. You know, stronger regulation of Wall Street, uh, more emphasis on the minimum wage, less emphasis on deficit reduction. It's interesting that the kind of the Peterson conservative approach around the, it's all about bringing the deficit down 
got very little traction uh, during the thing, during the campaign. So I do think that there is an emergent consensus in the Democratic Party, and I hope beyond the Democratic Party, that the issues of income inequality have to be dealt with. They need to be dealt with with strong, firm uh, policies, um, and there can't be any going backwards on that. They, you know, there can't be kind of, well, we can't push the minimum wage because we'll alienate the restaurant association, or we can't push Wall Street reform because we'll eliminate, right. we'll lower our contributions. That has to be a bold economic agenda that appeals to many, many, many people. And I think, if, I think the Democratic Party is moving in that direction. You had a preferred ticket in mind for this election, which is now, this is not to cast aspersions on any candidates or potential candidates, but you had a ticket that you, that you favored. Uh, what was that ticket? At one point in my, in my, in my fantasy <laughs> land, my fantasy football team, I thought a uh, Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren ticket would be really interesting. And, I think and Biden, why do you think it would, be so, would have been so strong? I think Joe Biden, in a kind of a cultural way, in a, in a heartland way, would have had a much stronger ability to, to pull, um, you know, uh, working class and middle class white votes uh, to the ticket. And I think Elizabeth Warren has right. been a, a fabulous tribune on behalf of bold economic policies and standing up for Wall Street. I think she's an exciting candidate. And I think those two, between the two of them, might have turned the tide in the election, although hindsight is, as we know, very, uh, very, 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 no, it very always, clear. It, it always is, but I do agree with you. That would have been a very strong ticket on this issue of inequality, which I agree with you, was one of the driving forces in this campaign. So let's try to end on a hopeful note. Uh, are there reasons for um, uh, progressives, liberals, Democrats, um, writ large, um, to be optimistic at this point. They didn't like the way the election went, but now we turn around and try and figure out a way to move forward in a positive direction. Is there any cause for optimism? You know, I think there is. I mean, I think short term, I think we should not assume the absolute worst about what a Trump presidency will be like. I think there were many parts of, uh, of, of, of his message. Some of, and we'll see where it goes, we'll see where it goes. Um, I think in a positive way, I think one, defending and advancing democratic institutions and opening up the right to vote and bringing more people into the process and just making our democracy as vibrant and inclusive as we can is one really important plank. I think continuing the conversation on race and, uh, and building a, a demos, if you will, of, uh, of, of the whole of our society, I think that can happen. Uh, I think it needs work. And then I think an economic agenda that really appeals to people and it isn't afraid to, uh, to you know, to, to tax progressively, to spend properly, and to make a difference in people's lives. I think all those things have the opportunity to build that coalition that I described that I think is a strong and potentially very durable uh, progressive coalition. On that note, we'll stop. Miles, it's been great talking with you, Miles right, Rappel. Thanks always. Take care. Okay. Good to um, see you. We'll be back in a moment with a final word. Ralph Cicerone was not widely known among the general public, which is a shame. Dr. Cicerone, who died recently, sent up some of the very early warning signals about global warming. He was on the case way back in the 1970s. Nearly three decades later, he was the head of a panel at the National Academy of Sciences that concluded, without equivocation, that greenhouse gases were accumulating in the Earth's atmosphere because of human activities, and, as a result, air and ocean temperatures were rising alarmingly. That panel of 11 leading scientists had been commissioned by President George W. Bush, and their findings were unanimous. Unfortunately, those findings didn't seem to make much of an impression on Mr. Bush. As the New York Times reported in Dr. Cicerone's obituary, the 11 scientists were outraged that Mr. Bush had recently rejected the International Global Warming Pact, known as the Kyoto Protocol. Fast forward to 2016. We are experiencing one record hot year after another. The seas are rising, ice caps are disappearing, glaciers are melting, storms are becoming ever more intense, and polar bears have been added to the endangered species list. And yet, the man that we've just elected president, Donald Trump, argued that global warming is a hoax cooked up 
to benefit the Chinese. Other members of Mr. Trump's party, the Republican Party, have been extremely equivocal on the issue of climate change, with candidates and office holders reluctant to accept the scientific findings, and in some cases denying that the climate is warming at all. How can this be in a so-called advanced country a decade and a half into the 21st century? The answer, of course, is that we are not nearly as advanced as we like to think we are. That's all for now. See you next time.